Hello there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. This is part two of our conversation with Michael Johnston and John Apple from Michael's Music Service. They were sharing their ideas about how to restore, reprint and distribute old organ music which is otherwise unavailable. Let's go to the show. Uh, the printing industry has relied on a business model of spending a great amount of time to produce a master from which very many copies could be made. Printing runs of hundreds of copies were sold to music dealers who kept them in stock and sold them in their stores. Producing such a great number of copies kept the price low. It also gave the engravers a chance to show off their artistic skill with complex and beautiful covers, many in color. In a retail music store, these eye-catching covers were an effective tool for attracting the attention of customers. And if you go to my website, I point to a an excellent history of music printing which shows you a video of the actual engraving that they used to do and it's at music print music printing history dot org uh, and we'll put that Vitas says he'll put that in the program notes absolutely uh, sa- sadly this model no longer works and hasn't for decades the hundreds of publishers have now been folded into only a few These larger companies, for the most part, do not have copies of the music, much less the original plates from which to print new copies. Some sheet music has been maintained in collections, but most has been discarded after the death of the original owner. A few collectors and libraries continue to hold their sheet music collections, but many have simply, usually automatically and poorly, scanned the originals and then discarded the originals due to lack of storage space and the false impression that the storage of the image file fulfills their responsibility as an archive. The few remaining copies, being a product of their time, were not intended to last for decades of use. The oil-based inks have lasted, but the paper, with its residual acid content, often has not. Think French music. Tears are common, especially at folds and dog ears, folded corners meant to make page turning easier. Then there are markings, some heavy and obliterating in pencil and in ink, stickers, cellophane and plastic tape, secondary stitching into the margins. You've seen that in library copies. Trimming ragged edges of paper to fit the shelves. Oh boy, have we seen that, especially if music printed before 1890. Mold, mildew infestation, insect damage, the little holes in there that the worms eat, they love to eat the paper, and missing parts of pages and even whole pages to deal with. If none of these problems is evident, there remains the wear and tear of the most useful music being played repeatedly over many years. Most organists are familiar with what happens to music that they have used often. Broken binding, loose signatures, detached pages, dried glue, and more. And I'll say that a lot of these uh, that I've mentioned get put onto electronic devices now and I have customers who actually want that they put uh, either a laptop or some kind of a, a screen on their music rack and they can they can actually play from the from the the image that's presented and if they have a certain kind of software they can actually make little notes on there mm. but while that's clever and it really is um, it's modern, what happens when that file is lost? Or the organist dies and the laptop is thrown away. There's, you know, all the notes. We have music, um, well, let's see, John, tell them, we have some, we have some of the copies from Dudley Buck, Clarence Eddy, um, didn't we have one, uh, tell him who some of the people are. We've had some that belong to Dudley Buck, to from Clarence Eddy, uh, from uh, Edwin Arthur Kraft, the Cleveland organist, and that some of these pieces are really not in good condition. They parts of them will almost crumble, and so consequently, you have to really be careful in the process of restoration to turn the pages carefully. If these copies were used if, as the normal performance medium that they would not last very long. 
And it's important, too, to see what they did. Uh, back in the old days when I was in school, I used to study the manuscripts of Stravinsky because Stravinsky actually wrote. He would put down his thoughts. And in the case of these organists, uh, you can see their writing. You can see, well, what they used. Did they use a uh, did they use an oboe or or did they use a clarinet or or did, you know what kind of stops did they use? Well, you don't get any of that on an electronic copy, if unless that electronic copy is somehow saved in a format that people can use. So anyway, the, uh, the restoration is the next part. To make a, sh a piece of sheet music available for sale, which is the intent, it must be on good, sturdy, acid-free paper, and the notes must be sharp and in high contrast. The paper finish should be flat and not reflective of light that would cause glare. The original paper size, if possible, should be used for the newly printed music and the original colors and engravings and process color graphics should be reproduced. Any missing bits should be replaced and any errors should be corrected with notes and the reason for this correction if necessary. Since the music is decades past its current style and understanding, a short article on the music, its composer, and related subjects is helpful. That's what John provides. The, and then I give examples, which we don't have here, but in the workshop I pass out examples of what we did, and the uh, I'm working on a, a cover now that's got two color, and it's just beautiful. It's a uh, it's piece by the by the famous uh, Everett Truitt, whose suite uh, we we announced this month. So, uh, John, do you have anything to say on the restoration? It's a, a very painstaking process at times because you're trying to not simply always restore what was there, but as was mentioned previously, to make corrections in sometimes actual notes or musical symbols. Yeah, sometimes you, you, you must understand that years ago when people were, were scratching the engraving into a, a, a metal plate, Making a correction was a very a laborious process, and a lot of times the engraver didn't do it, and if the proofreader didn't catch it, it went through. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to work with today. Okay, now John's going to tell you about the benefits, of, hopefully the benefits of what we do. Our restoration and distribution of worthy organ music, which was abandoned by its original publisher, and subsequent owners or controllers of copyright is an effort to slow the demise of printed organ music. The large publishers are more likely to produce a new edition of Bach than to reissue a work from the past, even if they are the controllers of copyright and have an original. Restoration can fill in the gaps that, that exist. For example, we restored the original Andantino by Edwin H. Lemaire though the edited version is still available. There are differences in the versions and no other publisher was interested. Additionally, I added a high quality photo and an inter interesting article by an expert on Le Maire in an attempt to attract attention. For another example, one publisher has recast the setting of new notation through computer software, usually to avoid the very large paper sizes or the landscape orientation that was popular for many years for organ music. 
several of Dudley Buck's pieces, so we have restored those not included in that publisher's efforts. One of the things that is is common now is that everybody wants to produce music that fits on eight and a half by eleven paper, and in in Europe, I guess that's the a a three size, a four, a a four size. Yeah. But it, it's just the size that people think that they can print. And of course, if you've seen music printed by a, a home printer, uh, it doesn't last. It, if it gets into the sunlight, it fades. It, it doesn't have the longevity. Plus, the fact that it's on really thin paper, unless you go to the trouble to put it in a binder, it's going to get lost or separated or, you know, who knows who knows what's going to happen. Absolutely. But in any case, in any case, do you remember the Vitor Schweitzer edition? Yeah, I do. Do you remember what size it was? It and was then the, oversized, I think. And then the, the next printing of it was even smaller. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they what they do is they don't shrink the plate size very much, but they take away the, the, the edges of the paper. The margins, right? So, so what happens is that a tear, a simple tear that used to be in a margin, is now into the music. Uh -huh. So if there's a bit of the music that was torn, used to be, well, that was just part of the two-inch margin. Now, you actually lose the music. The actual printed music is part of the tear and, and is torn away, gone forever. Yes, you are right. Uh, if they if they shrink the margins, it's very risky then for the music to be lost when you uh, play over and over again this piece, right? Right, and of course the binding. It, it, we we were uh, blessed with the invention of what's called the perfect binding. It was meant for paperback books, and it works fine for paperback books. But if you bind organ music like that, I dare you to get it to stay on the rack. Mm -hmm. It will not lie flat. It will okay. not, yeah. Unless, yeah. unless it's in landscape, um, landscape uh, format, probably. Yeah, the perfect binding still, if you try to make it lie flat, you're going to break it, and you'll hear it go crack. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, John, go ahead. Yeah. You may recall that the music of J.S. Bach was considered during his last years as old-fashioned <coughs> and was largely ignored until Mendelssohn <coughs> brought it back to the attention of musicians in Germany. Falling out of fashion is the most often given excuse for allowing the music of our past to be forgotten and even discarded. Following the period of decadence, it was fashionable to look down on the styles and practices of the past. We all know musical cliches today and enjoy making fun of them. It is important to know that these were not cliches during the time they were practiced. They were as much a part of the musical vocabulary as any other facet of music. Since several cycles of this in and out of fashion have taken place in Western music, the intelligent musician will realize that this is indeed a cycle which repeats everything old is new again. And the most serious damage in this was inflicted by organ teachers in schools who taught that certain music was to be avoided. This prohibited music was usually derided as bad or not good for students or overly sentimental. This was a cover-up for stylistic prejudice, pure and simple. Bad? The music of Eugene Thayer and Dudley Buck is good organ writing and fits the instruments they played perfectly. Payne's counterpoint is first class. Not good for students? The Dudley Buck pedal exercises are used by some even today. Chadwick's teaching of organ, theory, and composition led to his appointment as director of the New England Conservatory. Overly sentimental? Perhaps so, but this is also a not a reason to shun Franck or Schubert? Are they not overly sentimental? The fair-minded organist will make the decision based on his training and musical judgment and not on what is an accepted style of the time. Time has begun its inevitable swing back to the past. 
Transcriptions are being played and recorded today as never before. The gems of our organ past are appearing in churches and concert halls, and teachers are once more using some of the pieces which are certain to improve interest and audience numbers for a young organist. Closing your mind to music of the past was once a reason for discarding the music of J.S. Bach. An open mind is better. I found that uh, when I was in graduate school in the early 80s that there were, if you were to look at the organ recital programs that were performed by the organists under the major management firms, they largely avoided anything that was considered not uh, in good taste, uh, according to what they had been taught. It was only people who were not under the managements, Frederick Homan for one, that they performed and resurrected many of these things these pieces, original and transcription, that caused uh, a, a really rather great revival of interest in this music so that even some of these what you might call mainstream concert organists have taken to playing some of these pieces and some have actually made part of their career in performing this music such as Thomas Murray uh, and Thomas Trotter over in England. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, these gatekeepers, as we can call them, these organ professors who would uh, teach their ideas about who is good, who is bad, who is worthy, who is not so much, and pass on this um, stylistical prejudices to their students. They make, uh, I think, um, a disservice for 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 the organist and, and for organ world in general because their horizons are much much uh, smaller than I once ran, uh, had a phone call when I worked for a music store here that uh, was from a fellow student back at Westminster Choir College who had studied with Joan Lippincott there. And he happened, this would be 15 years later, called up from his church and he wanted to order a volume of Eugene Jigou and he said, I never learned about this composer when I studied organ, and it's really some good music. Guillemot the same way. Yeah, Guillemot. Uh, Guillemot music is, is sort of a little bit on the conservative, conservative uh, basically, side. Although he lived uh, well into the 20th, 20th century, his style is more or less 19th century, right? A romantic style. Uh, yes. uh, Frank was even more uh, daring as a composer in terms of chromaticisms and uh, rhythmical ideas. But uh, Gulma was sort of um, cautious about new things, right? But it doesn't mean we shouldn't should neglect his music, right? Because who are we to judge, right? Let the the future generations decide, and we just um, in let the music live again. I think that's our goal. In uh, the case of Gilma, that uh, when I was in college, there I believe was almost nothing of his that was published that all of it was out of print with the exception of maybe one or two pieces 
and beginning in the I believe the late 70s that Wayne Leopold began publishing uh, his complete edition and so consequently after he began doing this then Schott publisher uh, brought out all the sonatas um, and some others have brought out his music so that virtually all of Guillemont's organ music is available uh, during the last uh, 10 to 20 years whereas for the previous uh, 20 to 50 years much of it was unavailable true and the last topic <clears throat> was the scanned music I got lots of questions on scanning music but everybody does it and we'll avoid the issue of copyright because that that's a whole other seminar but for scan music I have points for blessings and curses the blessings are that scanning makes the music uh, more likely that the pieces will not be lost forever in that the Internet Archive will make basically copies and as long as the Internet Archive which is archive.org as long as that lasts then the copies will be able to be online distribution over the World Wide Web increases exposure among those who can and do use computers and printers one of the problems that that I've found is that many organists who are real organists do not have the time to spend on social media and they don't play with their phones all day and they don't some of them actually and this is hard to believe don't know how to use a computer or if they do they don't understand what a PDF is or how to print it uh, so they would prefer to deal with somebody like me and John where we just say sure I'll take care of it for you and I do the processing and then I just send them the music they open the package and then they play it and they're very happy and I'm very happy. That kind of organist perhaps is is not uh, is not common. Supporting information such as biographies, photos, and program notes can increase stylistic performance. Listening to an online recording may inspire an organist to learn a piece otherwise unknown. And I do offer a page, with, and I'll include the link on my website, michaelsmusicservice.com. I have dozens of recordings where you can hear other people who, who, are, uh, who contributed their recording for you to hear. And making a recording or a video helps to build pride and audience. And an online commerce makes worldwide distribution easier and less expensive. From the beginning, I've, I've sent things overseas. Um, I've had orders as far away as, as New Zealand on Australia. Um, we've had orders uh, go to Tokyo. So far I've not had an order to China, but I've had or orders from all over Europe, a few from Poland. Mm -hmm. I've had one from, from uh, Belarus, and it's wonderful to see that there are people all over the world who want it. Excellent. If you uh, have this... Prince Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you have this map of your customers, your future customers would be greatly encouraged to, to trust you more if you put the flags and uh, maps of the world and the little places where people buy from you. That would be great to see on your website too. I, 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 hadn't, uh, I hadn't thought of that. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll consider that. And uh, yeah, John just mentioned we we have a customer in uh, Peru, uh, which is uh, South America. Uh, but but so far I don't understand no China, uh, certainly from from Taiwan, but from China mainland nobody. And I know they have organs. They 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 just had brand new organs. So maybe later they'll buy some. Anyway, here are the curses for scanning music in the internet. Scanning is nearly almost always automated and not reflective of the size, contrast, or the quality of the original. Nearly all the scanning is done in grayscale, that's a technical term, it, it's shades of gray as opposed to black and white, which leaves out any color from the original. And I love the beautiful colors because it's part of our history and the fact that they use color to try to attract attention is I think it's fascinating. Although many organists do use browsers and printers, many are excluded because they don't want to learn how or they've tried it and become hopelessly frustrated or because they would rather spend their time doing something else such as learning or writing more music. 
most printers in homes print eight and a half as 11, or as you mentioned, the A4 a size as their maximum size. Most printer music is sold as 20 pound or lighter, and it's usually high in acid and results in music shrunk to fit a paper size smaller than the original. And just a point, if you get somebody who knows what they're doing, such as Sibley, which is the music library at Eastman School of Music, mm -hmm. they know what they're doing and their scans are full size. But when you try to print that, your printer software is going to shrink it to fit. So even though Sibley scanned it at the right size, what you get on your printer is going to be shrunk to fit on the size paper you have, which is going to be hard to read. The emergence of libraries offering their, quote, digital sheet music collections gives the impression of permanence for music, which is not true, as I mentioned earlier. The free distribution through the web has reduced sales of printed sheet music, reducing the number of pieces published and the number of publishers willing to produce new titles, as we talked about before. This is unfortunately a vicious cycle, which accelerates the death of printed music. So that's the end of the um, of the main seminar that I can do online. Uh, you have to come to the real one to get the handouts. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea, Michael. You know, you finished with this uh, sad note. This is the death of this vicious cycle. Um, end of, 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 of publishing, right? Uh, printed of music. But... Uh, Let's be hopeful for the future a little bit because right now as we're talking we're connecting through thousands and tens of thousands of miles across the Atlantic, right? In right. real time, in real time. Uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it would have been would have uh, couldn't be possible probably, right? And now the technology allows us to co to connect directly to our customers right either through social media or through through email newsletters or blog uh, software that you use for example you uh, by writing these little posts uh, every week you can connect with your subscribers and who will later can become your customers i think there is hope for the future and for the old music as well And the other thing that uh, I don't, <laughs> I, I quite honestly don't know of uh, organ music, uh, we'll call it original compositions or uh, written organ music in your part of the world, uh -huh. if there's something that is uh, has never been done that's a good piece or has uh, been uh, no longer available uh, that you think would be worthwhile for publication, let us know. You know, uh, there might be some ideas. I, I'll look around. Thanks for, for reminding me that. Yes, we have some interesting uh, Lithuanian music from 19th century too, which which are not... I'm not sure whether they are available or not, but it's worth, worth playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
One of the things that's hard to do from my end is to get people interested because, you know, they're, they're, you, you see online, uh, people are all the time playing more Bach, more Mendelssohn over and over and over and trying to get them to play some of the, the fun pieces that, you know, it's just very difficult sometimes to break mm -hmm. through. Well, one of the things we didn't talk about uh, is that some of what we've published is although there's not very much of it that was ever published, is related to the theater organ. Yeah, that was a great um, period of, of organ literature to play those wonderful Wurlitzers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they suffer, um, they suffer a double problem because in the organ music world, there are not very many theater organists. And the few theater organists there are generally played by ear and they don't read music or they don't like to read music so there was almost no theater organ published ever uh-huh do you publish or uh, theater organ music as well yeah if you go to the blog under suggested pieces you'll see there's very few because see, a real theater organ arrangement would have indications of when to hit the drum when to play the cymbal when to play the bird call you know and so many organists don't do that or they don't have a bird call. <laughs> and one of the books that we have available is a, a book of theater organ effects that one person back in the 1920s wrote as to what to do, uh, what notes to play on what types of stops to create this effect. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Things like dog barks and sneezes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like you hear on uh, NPR, right? Sometimes uh, uh, Prairie Home Companion, right? Uh, oh, do they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, they do that sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is a person who is imitating the nature sounds as well. publication of the In a Persian Market by Catelby was published in 1920 and the uh, arrangement was by Frank Matthew who was a theater organist in England and uh, he indicates uh, what to do on what he calls other organs and then how to what to use for Wurlitzer.
it's got indications for the drums and the tambourines and uh, the other one by Catelby in a monastery garden has a bird, a little. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's hard for you to hear it, but he's actually playing castanets. Uh huh. So it, uh, so wonderful. I'm. I, I've, I think uh, our listeners will enjoy knowing that you also publish uh, theater organ music as well, because uh, this instrument is on the rise uh, across the the world. I think this literature as well. You can f see lots of YouTube videos playing theater organs. Yeah. So yeah. there is great need for that as well. Yeah, there's a lot in Berlin. There's an interest. Uh, there's a museum in Berlin. Well, there's also another museum in Switzerland that uh, the fellow there has a, what they call a Britannic, it's a Velti organ, and uh, it plays a role that we've resurrected. And he got the people at the museum to to put the role on and play it. So I offer a recording of that. That's a, that's a lot of fun. It was a role made by Clarence Eddy. Oh, that's right. It's all these mechanical instruments with roles. Yeah. Uh, that's a tremendously important part of the literature in those days um, before the war, uh, Second World War, right? Uh, right. And uh, I remember music by Paul Hindemith, you know, this German composer, uh, who wrote also for, for the Welty organ. And uh, there is some something, some pieces still preserved to this day by Hindemith for organ. Well, and uh, Sassons actually wrote one piece for the uh, player organ uh -huh. that uh, has been put in notation, and uh, it's a fantasy. But these, um, the Clarence Eddy piece he's talking about is the Festival Prelude on Old Hundredth that we publish, and we have the recording on, on the page for the piece of that, um, that role playing it. And then on the pieces, uh, several of the pieces by Isaac von Vleck Flagler, uh, that there are Aeolian organ roles of those pieces. Wonderful. Is it a painstaking process also to recreate these roll music, or music from mechanical instruments? Uh, yes. Well, I, I don't do it. We have a friend in Switzerland who did it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Depending on the condition of the roll, uh, sometimes the paper becomes fragile, yeah. and um, it's very uh, tricky process sometimes to get these roles to play. And what they do is, it, in some cases, they have good roles and they keep it going and they play on the organ, and you can see that in in YouTube videos. But in some cases, the roles have deteriorated, so they scan the roles just once. And then they use the computer to create a file, which then hooks up to the player organ and plays it using the computer. Ah, that, that's that's because, safe. Yeah, because the roll would not last; it would it would crumble uh -huh, if, uh -huh. if they, you know if they played it. So this way, they can play it as many times as they want to and not tear the roll up. Exactly, because it's a historical material, very valuable, and you have to take care of it very carefully.
and what about the clock organ you know these old 18th century instruments or uh, clocks that are have um, organ mechanisms in it with pipes and uh, Haydn did that Handel did and sometimes we can have uh, um, a recreation of how these clock organs work and even have the the privilege of hearing Handel's music, Handel's concertos, um, on the clock organ. Yes, these uh, composers, um, including also Beethoven, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, um, wrote for this same type of organ that Mozart wrote his three pieces, and um, that there are recordings of some of these clock organs, uh, if we can believe the speed for especially the Haydn pieces, uh, are would fast go much faster than any organist could play them. Mm -hmm. well, so didn't Beethoven? Uh, didn't Beethoven do that for? Yes. Um, uh, was it Wellington's? Uh, yes. He, yeah, Welling well, Wellington's victory. Yeah, that. Uh, it either was the first version or a version of Wellington's victory is for the mechanical organ. Well, it's certainly very fascinating, uh, uh, these uh, mechanical advances, mechanical uh, engineering, basically, uh, experiments which led to create uh, these clock organ mechanisms. And uh, we can still hear those pieces to this day sometimes in museums. Yeah. There is a lot that can be done. One thing is to, one, buy music from publishers who still keep titles in print and from publishers who produce new music and keep it in print. The more music we buy, the longer and more likely they will be to continue publishing organ music. Support your local music store if there is one near you. Call a music store and buy from them if they are distant. Yeah. Contact the composer and offer a commission for new organ music. We've seen the positive effects of this due to commissions from such people as Marilyn Mason and Michael Barone. Buy your organist some new music and ask him to play it. Write about organ music you like in concert programs, church bulletins, essays, emails, blogs, and music magazines. Increased interest will prolong the life of our great organ music heritage. So there's the there's the positive ending to it. Uh, thank you so much, Michael and John. Uh, you know, your service is such such uh, such uh, importance uh, for the music world and. Um, I think not too many people realize uh, what kind of difficult work you do in in restoring and reprinting and and making these these things available across the world, right? And it's such a pain, painstaking job to recreate these manuscripts and old editions, and uh, first of all, located them in in other archives and uh, libraries, right? And make right. them. It's it's I I, I can. Uh, Imagine uh, what you are going through uh, through going through this research phase of your p operation when you um, uh, f contact the local publishers who are out of print, right? And then you right. go to Sibley Music Library. You try to uh, download or or s order the manuscripts from them. It's it's such a tremendously important work you do. Thank you so much. Well, I, I will, and, and uh, I, you just remind me of something. I have a, a wonderful story of just how we get music sometimes from the strangest places. Once upon a time, there was a musician <clears throat> who died, and he was very famous uh, all across the world, and his name was Duke Ellington. Well, when he died, his funeral was at the Cathedral of St. John Divine in New York City, and an organist named Alec Whiten was asked by Duke Ellington's sister to play Lotus, which was a composition by Billy Strayhorn, Duke's friend, and he actually wanted, uh, and, and, and uh, the sister wanted it to be played at Duke Ellington's funeral. So Alec made an improvisation on the piece that Duke Ellington used to end a lot of his concerts with, because Duke was not only a band leader, he was a piano player. Sure. So, what, so what happened was Lotus got played well, people begin to ask for it. So Alec listened to the tape, 
He wrote it down and sent it to the publisher. The publisher kept it in print for many years and then decided, well, we're not selling it. So they gave the copyright back to Alec, which very rarely happens. So I got it when Alec was still alive and put it back along with the letter from Duke Ellington's sister. And that's our biggest seller today. That's Lotus. But it's all because the company decided to give Alec back the copyright and Alec and I knew each other. He since uh, later afterwards got Alzheimer's and now has died. But his son, I still send the royalties for the Lotus to his son. So isn't that a great story? Absolutely. What was the, name of the, publisher? What was the publisher, John? Lorenz. It was Lorenz. Mm -hmm. yeah. So isn't that a great story? I wish more publishers would do that. It's, it's such an accident, right? Duke Ellington died and, and suddenly this, this piece was resurrected, right? Because of this event, of this uh, service, uh, liturgical service, right? Funeral. And um, that's where you come in later on. Yeah, yeah. So it's the biggest selling piece now. Um, I think since I've been producing it, we've sold nearly 400 copies over the years. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, and it's not hard. You know, it's not hard. It, it was Alex improvisation, and it, it, you know, anybody. If you can get over the number of flats, it's got a got a huge number of flats. But it it lies under the hands, and it's not difficult. Uh huh. Uh huh. And it's very beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for uh, giving us the chance to to be on your podcast. I've certainly followed you and uh, on Facebook, uh, and and uh, certainly I have your podcast on iTunes. So uh, I thought about doing a podcast, and I didn't do it because it looked like an awful lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Somebody had to start, so maybe other people will follow once once I started. Because I felt like like there are so many great, interesting people like you, you gentlemen, and others uh, who I interviewed or will interview in the future, hopefully. That need to be, um, you know, um, uh, b basically contacted, and uh, uh, they need to share their ideas with the organ world more widely. And um, it's yes, it's a lot of work, but it's much, it's worth it. I think it's worth it because the living voice of of your your um, conversation is it's such a. A f warm feeling, I believe, you get. You, you get a feeling that this person is with you in your room, right? Thank you very much for the work you do, because it's only in the sharing of information that uh, all of this can get out to a wider audience, both musicians and non-musicians. A lot of times we hear that the organists feel alone because they may be the only one in their community who plays and understands the organ or perhaps even classical music. So they, a lot of times people call, before we begin uh, our podcast recording today, I got a call from someone in Florida who just said, I wanted to talk to you about the piece of music that she ordered because there's nobody else in her church who really understands organ music. So she was happy to talk to somebody who cared. Yes. Thank you so much, Michael and John, for caring. And uh, would you please tell our listening listeners across the globe uh, 
where they can find you and your work online? Uh, everything is at michaelsmusicservice.com. Mm -hmm. The music, the, the, the free audio files, uh, the blog, everything is there, michaelsmusicservice.com. We're also on Facebook, if that matters, and I'm on Twitter. I have people all over the world who, who talk organ on Twitter. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. So um, I'll make sure to um, to include these all these links into our conversation, and I wish I wish you great success with uh, resurrecting old music and uh, giving it a second chance. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. See you. Bye. Musical examples for today's conversation were taken from michaelsmusicservice.com. And you can find uh, much more uh, information about the composers, even free MP3s, scores from that website. Make sure you visit their blog and subscribe to it. And there are wonderful and interesting mus organ music links from all over the world will come to your email inbox. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog, Secrets of Organ Playing, at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you online really soon.